Hi everyone, Nick here from Conservation Careers and welcome to the podcast. Now, did you know that orangutans are the most intelligent beings on the planet after human beings? Perfectly adapted to their environment, they pass on their knowledge and culture through each generation in order to help future generations to thrive. And as a self-aware being, as intelligent as a six-year-old child, their drive to extinction is an individual story of horror, sometimes being macheted and burnt alive as an agricultural pest. Now, to talk us through the conservation story of orangutans today is the world-renowned founder of the Orangutan Project, Leif Cox. Leif has had a 30-year career working with orangutans. He's a passionate campaigner for the species, and he's been a key player in developing conservation plans for orangutans and influencing positive change for their protection and survival. This includes the first ever successful reintroduction of a zoo-born orangutan into the wild. And we start the chat today with his first connection with the species before talking about what it makes the species special and so fragile, before discussing the threats they face and conservation activities that could turn their story around. We also discuss the skills, roles and mindset needed in order to succeed in nature conservation on the front line. It's a wide ranging, thoughtful and fascinating discussion. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Leif Cox. I'm the founder of the Orangutan Project. Welcome, Leif. Uh, really nice to meet you and to get to know a little bit more about your work. So you're the founder of the Orangutan Project. And from what I've read before this chat and seen about you, is you've had a, a, um, a long, dedicated career seeking to conserve this I got most interesting and fascinating, charismatic species, the Orangutan. Mm -hmm. um, I've been thinking about where to start the conversation, but I think I'd like to sort of start at the beginning for you, really. Like, where did your connection and interest in orangutans first, first come about? Like, how where did you first experience them? Where did that interest kind of start? I'm, I was working with 15 orangutans um, here in Perth and discovered that they're self-aware persons that um, don't belong in captivity. And then... Soon after, um, obviously, discovering that they've been driven to extinction. Um, this, in fact, this more noble form of humanity than we find in Homo sapiens, um, being killed and destroyed for the greed of a few people. Right. And so that, that kind of set me on my um, life mission, um, not only to um, betterment the welfare of these non-human persons, um, but also to ensure their species survives this extinction crisis. Right. And you mentioned you first met them in Perth. So mm -hmm. orangutans are not native to Australia and Perth. As best I understand it, they're on the island of Borneo and I think Sumatra mm -hmm. as well. Um, mm -hmm. What was your connection in Perth? They were obviously in captivity. Like, what were you doing there? Mm -hmm. I, I was looking after them. They're mm -hmm. the, um, the, the world's most successful, largest colony of orangutans um, lives in Perth, uh, a large extended family group um, having over 26 babies. Um, and many of those um, I've been with from birth um, and then eventually seeing them um, being taken, taken them back and introducing them back into the wild we were protecting habitat in Sumatra. So the, taking them on that entire journey, um, um, you know, from day one all the way back to being um, free in the wild. Right. I'd love to know a bit more about that as well, because I believe you were sort of involved in some of the first releases of captive-born orangutans actually into the wild and sort of hear more mm -hmm. about that. But I think before we sort of dive into that and more about your work and your career, uh, just paint us a bit of a picture about what it's like what are orangutans like as individuals? Mm -hmm. um, what's unique, special about them? Um, how, when I look at pictures, I'm a father of three, okay? So I've got three young boys, four, four, and seven. And I read that an orangutan is the intelligence of about a six-year-old. And when I look at images of orangutans, it really tugs on my heartstrings. Like I'm looking at, you know, uh, someone so intelligent and close to humanity but you've had you know 20 30 years experience of these individuals you know what are they like as 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 individuals as species mm. i mean the, the, the first answer is what they're like as individuals is that they're individuals 
Yeah. You know, so, you know, each one of them has a distinct personality, um, just as we do. They're self-aware persons, um, just as we are. The, the second part of that is um, I describe them as a more noble form of humanity. Yeah. Because although humans are capable of so much empathy, love, and compassion, we're capable of so much anger, um, bitterness, and horror, and then how we treat each other and other animals that exist on the planet. Orangutans don't have that. They don't have what I call a kill switch. And so the metaphor I use or the analogy I use is we killed over a million of them in the most horrific ways possible, macheting them, burning them alive, but driving them to extinction. Um, although they're at least four times stronger than a human being and the males have canine the same size of a tiger, there's not one rec- record in all of history in a zoo or sanctuary in the wild of orangutan ever killing a human being. So a far more noble um, form of humanity. The next aspect, you talked about their intelligence. We know as compared to our intelligence, they're the most intelligent being that shares our planet. That's what's the scientific evidence tells us. However, that disguises the, how truly intelligent they are. And I'll quickly explain that. Yeah. Um, becoming intelligent for a species can actually be the dumbest thing a species can do. Because as we sit here chatting, 80% of the calories we're consuming is basically trying to keep this large brain going. Brains are very calorie intense organs. So if you d- you develop a larger brain for an intelligence that's not needed for your survival, you create this huge liability with no assets. So species such as, including ourselves, we only become intelligent in ways which in- increases our ability to survive the environment, either through our natural um, propensities in our brain, natural, uh, or our cultural programming of that brain. And orangutans, just like us, adopted the environment predominantly through culture as intelligent beings rather than natural selections. But that leads on to the fact that actually from an orangutan's point of view, they're far more intelligent than us. For example, they have these spatial temporal maps where fruit is located all over the forest over many, many years, which is beyond the human capacity to learn and understand because that's what they need to survive. So we may look at orangutans as a dunce in a classroom, but in the rainforest, which they're adapted to, they're geniuses. Mm. And this is why we often, when we see them in zoos, we often see an ugly caricature of these magnificent beings. Just as, for example, going into mental asylum or prison and studying humans and saying, well, all humans act like this. That's not true. Once you can get to see their magnificence of how they live in their own communities and cultures in their natural environment, you realise that um, their intelligence in their ways is beyond our capacity. So how do orangutans typically live in the wild, then outside mm-hmm. of a captive environment, you know, a, a truly native wild group? I'm assuming they live in a group. I'm coming to this quite naive. And what does mm-hmm. a typical year look like? What are the sorts of things that this group um, have to achieve in order to survive and thrive? Mm-hmm. They live in extended groups. Mm-hmm. Now, if you had a like a tight group of orangutans in the rainforest, they were started there because the food is extremely um, dispersed over time and distance. Mm-hmm. So they live, the females with their one or two offspring live alone and all the females are getting ever related. They set up territories next to their mothers. But they have a rich and um, beautiful um, group dynamics and, um, and relationships. So, for example, when there's big fruiting trees, they all eat together and the babies play together. It's a bit like our Christmas and Easter's where we all come <laughs> together, you know, and, and, and then we separate to go off to our own areas to live and, and work and, and, and gain a living. So very similar to, to, to how we operate. Um, I often describe them the same as people who live in countries in, in, in a country lifestyle in, in, in the UK, America or England, you know, that same sort of fusion fission relationship of their rich and diverse communities. Mm-hmm. But I also describe that they adapt to the environment through culture. So, 
Um, unintelligent animals will have a born with hardwired brains with lots of instinct, yep. and they have lots of offspring, each genetically a little bit different, and nature selects which of those offspring is most adapted to the ever-changing environment. Now, us orangutans and other intelligent persons such as elephants have decided we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to have babies born with vacant brains and have long maternal learning periods. The orangutans will suckle their offspring to eight years wow. and the, the female orangutan will stay up to about 12 years with her mother. And what they're doing, they're programming that culture, mm. which makes them uniquely fit and adapted to the environment. Unfortunately, when you adapt to the environment in this way, you cannot survive if a predator is reintroduced into the environment because you're investing very heavily in few offspring, which is why orangutans as the slowest reproducing species in the world because of this strategy is most vulnerable to extinction. So very small losses within the population spiral the population to extinction, which makes it so much more critical that we have concerted efforts to save the species this decade. Right. And when we talk about culture, as, a, as I'm listening to yourself, this is all about really learning how to live and thrive within quite a unique, distinct landscape for that cultural group, which has been learned over presumably millennia you know it's about passing on this knowledge about this is how we live here and how we thrive exactly you know yeah. we we have a, maybe a, a perverse understanding of culture we think oh well it's art and paintings and yeah. dancing and you know no, no it's not <laughs> culture is a way we adapt to the environment yeah it, it's not div um, divorced from the environment because that, that's why when you have native cultures where suddenly the environment changes very quickly by and, yeah. and you know more technology advanced group entering yeah that culture becomes dysfunctional yeah yeah because you can't if you hold on to that culture it, it's it made them totally functional previously now they become dysfunctional because the environment change changes um and so this is why um one of the reasons as well as obviously captivity for persons don't do well because as we know as human beings, we don't do well in captivity. Even refugees, whether looked after and people are there to care for them, suffer greatly from captivity. Yeah. Um, but secondly is they're culturally not adapted to survive in, in captive situations. And in fact, what we, we see that if orphan orangutans are, are brought up in cages and confined conditions, they then culturally adapt to survive in a cage and they therefore they become less able to survive in a while that cultural adaptation especially when young is, is extremely important and this is why when we're doing a orangutan rehabilitation we have to get those orphans out back into the jungle and in their own um, socializing with other orangutans as, as quick as possible because their little brains just as our brains do adapt to the environment for which we're in and we our intelligence also adapts you know so we, we may if we adapted to living in a refugee camp we become geniuses of working in a refugee camp and the inequities of that but when released out of the refugee camp we, we, we often will become dysfunctional okay where where are the males in all this then so you describe the females the matriarch daughters living nearby in territories mm. what are the males doing in all this mm. how are they different yeah ma males are interesting um best thing a male can do once he's uh, he's got a female pregnant is get the hell out of there right he's twice the size of a female and basically he's this large fruit eating machine mm -hmm. right and you don't want this large fruit eating machine anywhere around you and your baby when you're trying to echo living out there with, with a young baby so the best thing he can do is is get out of the way um because They've evolved with no natural predators, so he doesn't is not needed to protect the mother and baby. Mm. Um, we, um, because of our bipedal motion, we have to have um, um, babies which are born relatively immature to pass the birth canal, and even then, passing through the birth canal is very dangerous for human females because the narrow hips is one of the most dangerous things we can do. Yep. Orangutans don't have a problem because they don't walk bipedally. In fact, or orangutan's um, a mother in Sumatra now, seeing the rainforest, has better chances of survival than a, a human mother in America. 
oh because they inherently just don't have those problems. Um, so when a human female um, um, has birth, she needs lots of support. She needs a pair bonded mate to look after, and she needs the support of the entire community to ensure she can successfully raise her offspring. Orangutan is totally opposite. It's best that the male and anyone else just gets out of the way because you know she doesn't have all those problems. Um, she just needs to find enough food. And so what happens is the males always leave the natal territory and they form, often they form these little bands of um, rat bag teenage males causing havoc and undertaking high risk behavior. That may sound familiar <laughs> um, yep. because that's what human males do. Um, and this is what we, this is where natural selection occurs. Natural selection doesn't occur with the females because they're passing culture from generation to generation. And you can't have in the females dying if that population survived. But you only need one in five, one in four males surviving to reproduce mm. the next generation. So you want them to go through this high selection, natural selection period where they die, they cause trouble, they fight, they go off in strange areas. And so you only get the best surviving. And then when they come to a new territory with their big cheek flanges and a throat sack looking all sexy, the females know, hey, your genes are good. You know, I've got the culture, you've got the genes, um, we, sh we should really get together and produce the, the next generation. Mm, great. Okay. I think we're starting to get a grips with uh, just a fascinating species. I'm um, really fascinating species. Um, what, what are some of the threats then? What, well, what's its current conservation status? Should we be worried about orangutans right now? And, um, and what are causing some of the threats to the species if it's having mm. a rough time? Oh, we should be desperately worried. They're critically endangered by the International Union of Nature Conservation. Um, all three species are, are declining. Um, we lost 80% of the habitat in the last 20 years. You know, destruction for unsustainable monocultures such as palm oil mm. and pulp paper. So, you know, and um, they're the most vulnerable species to extinction, as we just discussed earlier. And now we're seeing these feedback loops because there's so little rainforest, it doesn't produce any rain anymore or very little rain, which then causes more fires, more droughts, lower fruit productivity, which causes the forest to collapse further, which causes climate change, which increases temperature, which again fulfills these, these, these spiral cycles. So all these things are linked. So, you know, destruction of rainforest is a major driver of climate change, Climate change is now feeding back as a, as a major problem for the rainforest. So we only got enough 10 years to, to save enough rainforest, enough orangutans for them to survive. So 10 years before it's all over. But let me qualify that because people will say, oh, you're saying the orangutans will be extinct in 10 years or there'll be no rainforest in 10 years. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if we don't save enough rainforest down with the 10 years, the rainforest is not sustainable and will collapse. You know, and for example, our scientists predict the Amazon will end up be a savanna, you know, because it can no longer support itself as a rainforest. Similarly, there'll be orangutans in 10 years and a lot longer than that, but their populations may no longer be viable mm -hmm. and over generations collapse. And, and then so this is why um, it's, it's important, I will say, we're not only living for climate change, but for the orangutans, we're, we're looking at the most important decade in human history. And 10 years is just nothing. Just nothing. I was yeah, lucky it, it, enough, it, sorry, I was looking to see orangutans. Crisis is the word, yeah. Yeah, I saw them 20 years ago as a student sort of travelling around Borneo. I went to Sepilok, which is probably a name you <laughs> know well. Um, saw them there. Um, not necessarily in the wild, these are obviously cared for, but that was 20 years ago. And you're talking about 10 years being our time limit now. Yeah. Yeah. Ten, I mean, this is, you know, if, if you want to be a fake conservationist, you, you can come back in 10 years and say there's some rainforest, some orangutan, but then I job and what's the problem. But um, if you're coming from an ecological po point of view mm -hmm. of sustaining, sustainable um, mm -hmm. um, ecology, sustainable um, environments, you know, the right type, shape and size of rainforest for it to survive and then expand and rewild the planet that, as we do, and we have enough population genetically survive, it's a very different situation. Yeah. 
um, yeah, and and and, and you know, and as small population biologists, that you know was one the job my jobs I had. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I I, I see the, the the dire need to take immediate action. Okay, so what form should and does that action take? You're the founder of the Orangutan Project. Um, maybe we can start there. Tell us a little bit about what is the Orangutan Project and what are some of the kind of you know conservation projects or interventions mm -hmm. and how do you see this being resolved in, within the sorts of timescales we're talking? Mm -hmm. uh, our strategy is to save eight ecosystems of the right type, shape and size of rainforest mm -hmm. to take all the species and subspecies of orangutans through its extinction crisis mm -hmm. and provide the biological basis to start rewilding the, the planet. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's our goal. And we not only hope to save these ecosystems, and when I mean the right type of sh shape and size, I mean, for example, often they'll just conserve the hills. And uh, orangutans, like tigers and elephants, need lowland river rainforests just to survive. So just saving rainforest doesn't work. You got to save complete ecosystem, the right type of shape and size. Okay. But our ambition goes a little bit further than that. We're hoping to complete our work with the indigenous communities to, to, who develop agricultural systems under the rainforest canopy. Um, so that these ecosystems will be handed over to future generations, not only environmentally sustainable, but economically sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so both people, animals, the environment and the economy will prosper um, within these ecosystems and provide a model for biological and economic expansion beyond that in future years. Okay. So just to kind of unpick that slightly then, so you're looking to conserve ecosystems at the landscape scale or at a scale that is appropriate to an orangutan and everything else that survives within that area and to shift the financial incentives for humans to conserve the forest by, by allowing the forest to produce a sustainable livelihood for people that's also um, sustainable for animals too, by which you mean sort of farming, sustainably farming the forest. Is that correct? Rather than clear felling and taking a quick book, you're talking about continuously mm -hmm. maintaining a forest that's also providing an income for humans. Yeah, let, let me explain that. Yeah. I mean, the destruction of the rainforest is by, for unsustainable means, unsustainable forms of monoculture, such as palm oil, pulp yeah. paper, rubber, whatever they have right which it to put bluntly is clear felling is that correct it just means removing the forest. They clear fill and replace to i monoculture i.e one plant okay. now all monocultures are unsustainable that's a nature it doesn't matter whether you're wheat farming in america or vegetable farming in england it doesn't matter if you have a monoculture you would collapse the system that's yep. your heart, how nature works so god knows how they come up with the idea of having sustainable palm oil you know, <laughs> talk about not understanding the science that you know underpins the planet. Yeah. So, but it's all about just exploitation, destroy the environment, maximize gain, extract resources out, maximum exploitation. Um, that's what these monocultures are about. Yep. Now, at the other end of that is you have the indigenous communities, which are hunter gatherers or slash and burn agriculture. They've been cutting down a bit of rainforest. Um, burning the scrub because the rainforest soil is poor, putting the nutrients in the soil, planting their crops for three years until the soil is exhausted and move on. Now, this is totally sustainable. By the time they came back, the forest is regenerated, the soil is, is, is reconstituted, and they start the process again. Mm -hmm. Now, because their indigenous rights have not been recognised and they've given their land to these greedy multinationals who want to rate the environment and rate the future economy and sustainability of the country they, their systems are now unsustainable not because they've done anything wrong it's their land has been taken so we need to do two things we're doing two things one is developing cash crops such as shade cocoa shade coffee vanilla dragon's blood honey productions as you know several examples under the rainforest canopy so they can become rich and prosperous and in the meantime we're educating and feeding the children and, but also we're developing um, through um, uh, regenerative agriculture um, around the village that they can plant all their dry rice and fruit and vegetables and everything within 10 metres of the hut through these new re regenerative practices. Um, so, yeah, there's some, you know, so then for they can feed themselves and they can get money 
and other cool things we, we, we're looking into now is, you know, having solar and um, small scale hydrology, hydrology um, electricity. And then you have smart grid systems where they sell to each other in, in the village within the rainforest. So it's totally sustainable, you know, you know, soon, you know, we're, you know, maybe someone like Elon Musk will end up soon having satellites. So we get free internet, you know, in the rainforest. And so all the information in the world will, will be available to uh, the people. Mm-hmm. So we're talking not about having t- um, competition between wildlife and people, the environment versus economy. We're talking about making this rich you know, future um, for people and environment together. And all we got to do is we got to do this in time and stop the exploitative, yeah, this the destructive nature of um, feeding the greed of a few greedy rich people. That's a real uh, outcome here. Not that we have to um, compete with humans. Um, we, we can make it work together. And how do the local communities view the sort of work that you're doing then through the Orangutan Project? Are you um, welcomed with open open arms? Are they suspicious? Do they feel the same need to preserve their own culture and sustainable lifestyles within the forest? Just maybe talk to that if you could, please. Yeah, no, it's certainly a challenge. There's a few reasons. A lot of conservation is done by grant tick a box, you know, you know. Oh, I've got a grant, I'll go and do this community work or what, and I tick the box, the grant finishes and the program shuts down. So these guys have seen that. <laughs> they come and go, they do some and they bugger off and, mm-hmm. you know, we know better off, you know. The conservation is long-term. <laughs> that makes sense. You go into the ecosystem, you work and you, know, and you communicate with people and that sort of stuff. But the course of challenges that we discussed, um, you know, their culture is no longer viable because the environment has changed because they're, they're sitting in a smaller patch of forest. Mm-hmm. And so, it ha- you know, we, we have to take them through um, that system, you know, of, of the change. And that's often difficult, you know, and often once you have these kind of um, um, systems under pressure, you get, you know, the, you know, the, um, um, you know, like we have this idea in our head that from our, up, um, our cultural upbringing you know, in the tribal, when things are tough, we look for the tough man to get us out of the problem. This is why Donald Trump or Putin becomes popular. Doesn't make sense. They're complete lunatics. Yes, but our brain goes, "Oh, this, this, you know, we get the tough man. You know, he may we don't like him. He may be a jerk, but he's going to save us. You know." Mm-hmm. So we have this mentality. So often you have you could have perverse outcomes. The other thing that often happens is a disempowerment of women in society. Once the culture starts breaking down, w- women who often have a lot of power in society. Uh, are, are disempowered and this is just not only a problem from a um, human rights perspective it's a problem from a conservation perspective because women tend to intuitively understand conservation better mm-hmm. men are geared up for competition short-term gain women is um, social cohesion long-term gain mm. and so which is more conservation ethics so one of the things we do is we want to do is empower women in, in society mm. yeah but we want to empower everybody and, mm-hmm. you know, and so it, it, it takes a while to, to take people on the journey, you know, um, from, you know, A to B. I mean, one example is I, we talked about regenerative agriculture. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to develop with my friend of mine around the hut systems. Mm-hmm. Um, he's been doing it in Africa for, for many years and I'm mm-hmm. just trying to ex, you know, <laughs> grab his expertise and reapply it to a different environment. Yeah. Now, one of the reasons is, is, um, if you look at our maps of this, uh, let's say a particular ecosystem we're talking about, okay, yeah, yeah, we're not cutting down any big forests, so we're planting the, the you know, the agricultural systems. But you've got to remember, these guys have been bottom of the food chain for a long while, exploited by everybody. And their psychological security is they grow their own food. Worst case scenario, I'm eating that food there. Yeah. Yep. And so you can't stop them cutting down the rainforest. We're trying to conserve the rainforest, and they're still cutting it down because they're planting their rice and whatever. Mm-hmm. And you can't stop them from doing that. Um, even if you hand them a bag of rice and say, don't do it, that's not that's not empowering to them. That's mm-hmm. not their security. Well, I don't know if you're going to be next week, give me the rice, you know, and mm-hmm. I want control mm-hmm. of my environment. Mm-hmm. So we have, so what, that's why regenerative agriculture of their daily food system needs to be added in, into the mix. Mm-hmm. 
So it just gives you the idea of complexity of moving, you know, um, um, a group of people, you know, um, so, but in an empowered way, you know, from a situation, no fault of their own, that they will actually contribute to the last destruction of the last environment, mm -hmm. yeah, to moving it to where they thrive and, and benefit um, and, yeah, and become prosperous with the environment. So it's, it's, it's like anything in conservation. Um, there's no, it, with all these things, it's very complex. And for marketing, everyone wants a simple solution, plant a tree or fund a ranger or, you know what I mean? Something simple or, or rescue an orangutan, just something, you know, that's what sells. That's great marketing. But conservation is not like that at all. You know, it's an extremely complex, long-term proposition. You know, and um, you know, by the time you explain to people, they're asleep, you know, <laughs> and and they're gone off. So, um, but so there's, there's often a very different to do in a sense what we you know the, the market marketing and the the complexity of conservation outcomes. Yeah, and it's a sort of it's a recurring theme we hear through the podcast and others is that. You know, people often get into conservation because of a, a passion for animals, for wildlife, in your case, you know, the orangutan, but then it quickly becomes about people and working with people, and particularly how we work with local communities, which, you know, um, often hold the solutions to, you know, our conservation interventions. And I, I, sorry, you want to speak? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I've, I've broadened it out is, yep. um, you know, the trouble is, you often, you know, people come to I love animals. I hate people. Well, you ain't going to do much job here, you know, or I just want to save this animal, not that animal. I'm into birds or something, you know, yeah. I'm not into monkeys, you know, that's not how it's going to work. That's not how I can make, how I would describe my relationship with conservation. Orangutans are the center of my love, but not the boundary. Mm -hmm. And if I, if they remained the boundary of my love, I could not effectively make any change. Mm -hmm. So women, children, indigenous communities, future generations, the other species, and you know, all those things must be within the boundary of our concern. You know, um, mm -hmm. otherwise it's simply not going to work. Yeah. And that goes to saving the planet as well. You know, you know, mm -hmm. if, if, and before we'd be able to divorce ourselves. Oh yeah, we can exploit these developing nations. We can exploit these communities, and we can, you know. That's fine. It's never going to come back to bite us, is it? You know. Mm -hmm. Well, it is, right? It's got to the point globally it's coming back to bite us, and it comes back to bite us on the landscape ecosystem scale as well. And so um, mm -hmm. we have to. This is why I always say, is we have to, and this is one aspect of it. We have to reform ourselves before we can reform the world. Otherwise, we create more problems than we ever solve. Yeah. And in many ways, species like the orangutan holding the place they do within an ecosystem provides a, a focus, a flagship, I guess, that, you know, helps us to conserve other species. Um, but it's well, really about the whole ecosystem as a whole. It, it, exactly. And so what we, you know, for example, we call the orangutans an umbrella species. Yeah. The concept is if we save the orangutans in their population, the habitat, all the rest is going along for the free ride. Yep. You don't have to have the Sumatran school project or whatnot, right? They're all just for, for free, right? But this is actually why I started and run the International Elephant Project, International Tiger Project. But what we discovered is there's two species falling outside the umbrella. Yep. You know, elephants and people were killing each other in the last remaining habitat, and they had a fragmented herd over the entire island. Tigers had fragmented all over the island. They had criminal senators coming and poached them for the Chinese medicine trade. So we had to develop those projects to bring those last remaining megafauna under our umbrella of, of conservation. Yep. Um, because, yeah, I mean, we talked about, for example, orangutans. We still have the opportunity for orangutans to survive in sustainable populations if we act in the next 10 years. That train has left the station for tigers and elephants a long time ago. Mm -hmm. we, what we're planning to do is manage, you know, um, you know, groups of tigers up to 30 or 150 elephants, and we have to transfer the males every every so often between these isolated populations. Mm -hmm. To maintain so least, that gene pool, yeah. For the next few hundred years, we're going to be managing these species in order to take them through this extinction crisis. Mm -hmm. We're not quite there with orangutans. We, I think we can do it. And it's more important for orangutans because of their unique 
culture adapted to every particular ecosystem and environment. Moving them is, is far more costly. That's why reintroduction is always a poor substitute for saving a forest and the population in the first place. Yep. And so we're not only trying to save the population, we need to save the unique culture from the ecosystem where over generations they've learned how to survive within that ecosystem. Yeah. Okay. What I'd like to do is discuss a bit more then about what it's like to be a conservationist. And um, I mean, we, we're talking, it seems to me, around community-based conservation interventions, you know, about working with local people to conserve, you know, large ecosystems, landscapes, um, and through the work that you're doing. What are the sorts of skills that um, people like yourself or people within your team need? Like, what does the community-based conservation industry need in terms of skill sets? Yeah, um, the, the simple answer to that is all of them. Right. Yeah, just explain that quick. Yeah, um, as individuals, we are rather pathetic, <laughs> physically and mentally. We don't contain much information. Much of the information we claim are, are our own, we don't know. You know, the example I give is we all claim we know that the Earth moves around the sun. No, we don't, unless we're astrophysicists. We just know somebody that we know that knows this. And, but we claim it as our own knowledge, you know, um, but this is what we do all the time. And so um, to, in order to enact conservation, we can't do it alone. We have to mm -hmm. learn to collectivise, and we have to learn to collectivise with people with different skills, knowledges, and intelligence than our own. Mm -hmm. And so it's been an accountant, it's been a lawyer, it, you know, it's been a community worker, it's been, uh, you know, a orangutan guy rescuing orangutans and reintroducing wild. Some person knows how to do agriculture, an example. Pretty much everything you can think about because it's the whole community, educating the school children, you know, um, marketing, fundraising, you know, every skill that you we need in society, we need to collectivise that skill in order to, you know, to conserve and save these ecosystems um, in the right measure. And, and so, you know, what do we need for conservation? We need it, we need it all. Uh, I just happened to have had the privilege of working personally with orangutans for 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, but that may, you know, not be the most important skill. It's certainly one of the skills we need, but, but certainly it, it's, it's just it's one of many skills that we need to collectivize together to make effective, meaningful change. That's a great answer. And if people listening to the podcast would also like to sort of follow in a similar path to yourself, you know, and be, let's face it, on the front line of, you know, conservation of the tropics and, and key species, um, what advice would you give them? Say, give to say a twenty-year-old, you know, student mm -hmm. at university. What advice would you give them, looking looking to really apply themselves and to get hired, get on in the world? Yeah, my first advice is: before you try to reform the world, start reforming yourself. Yeah, um, there's two reasons for that. Conservation, I described, is a marathon with hurdles, with a professional boxer punching you in the face every two hundred meters. <laughs> it's a tough gig. Right. <laughs> if it was easy, everybody would be doing it and the problems would be solved by now. So don't expect, you know, um, short term outcomes. So you have to be resilient. The other aspect to it is um, if you are unhappy inside and you need to support your sense of self-worth through money, fame, reputation and power, which many people in conservation need, they end up fighting each other and competing against each other. You ask, you ask many conservations who they hate the most and who they, you know, who they get angry at. It's the conservation down the road. He got, he's more famous than me or he got that grant or he's saying something slightly different to me, you know. Um, because you can imagine, for example, if you want to save the world, you need someone destroying it. It's a symbiotic relationship. You know, Superman needs Lex Luthor. Otherwise, he's just a funny guy in a cape, right? And, you know, conservation is when someone destroys the environment, you know. Um, it supports our sense of self-worth. You know, we're heroes, save the environment. But unless we reform ourselves and become selfless, right? I've seen so many times conservation is attacking each other and it destroys our cause. So selfish short-term gain is fantastic for running a business and palm oil business or whatever, exploiting the environment, coal mines. You can make a fortune doing that. Yeah, But it's not the same mentality and structure 
that we need. We've got to be loving, giving, holistic, work with others, yeah? Um, supplement our sense of own being, self, yeah. to the cause. Um, but don't get me wrong. Um, the If you can do that, if you don't do that, you're just going to get beaten up and frustrated. You're going to take it out and everybody else eventually quit conservation because, you know, that's that's why I see it all the time. Mm-hmm. But if you can become selfless, you know, and, and find that joy and express that joy and love within yourself, conservation is the most rewarding, beautiful thing that you can do. You know, you end up surrounding yourself by wonderful, dedicated people, you know, and every orangutan you save or tiger you save from a snare or community you, you support and, and progress, you know. It's it's just it's a wonderful experience of, of, of giving and, and you know it's a wonderful life, but you have to be prepared to do the work on yourself um, while you're doing the work on, on on saving the world. So that's that's my 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 mm. first advice. Mm. My second bit of advice is often you know you, you've got to do what's necessary. Often you know people I get you know calls every week. I've got a business now, plant a tree, you know, I want to plant, I'll give you a dollar for every tree you plant, or, you know, I want to do this. Well, actually, we don't need that at the moment. You know, this bit of forest is going to regenerate quick without planting or whatnot. Mm-hmm. So that, or I'm an expert in this field and I want to apply it. What we got, and that's kind of like, um, I was, my analogy is going to the doctor each time and um, each time, you get the same medicine in the same dosage. <laughs> no, that's, you just, it's foolish, just wasting your time and money. We got to look at each ecosystem and apply the medicine in the right dosage. Mm-hmm. And so as a conservationist, you know, because it's not about me, yes, I happen to have knowledge and experience with the orangutans, but I, I've written three books, you know. Um, I, I do talks, I do lectures, I, I'm here doing podcasts. Mm-hmm. I, I'm a head of seven charities around the world you know i'm I, i'm on the you know on the technical advisory group for six foundations and companies in the, in that you know so it's a diverse range you know of, of things the reason being is um you got to do what's necessary to get the job done mm-hmm. maybe i just another analogy i went to one of those um working you know those whether in the office sometimes they always get people together and you go away for the weekend and you learn how like to a retreat yeah team by and they had this thing you had to build a tower so high out of paper and one guy was commanding everybody one one just seen the cutting i asked, actually asked the guy i said well which one do you reckon is the leader and he goes oh, i always know the leader the leader is the one who will do anything it takes whatever job it is menial or not to get the job done mm-hmm. that's a leader you want not the guy who wants to be the leader, doesn't make sense, you know, and mm-hmm. wants to control because that's what his ego says, or the one is too scared, you know, so just sits there and does them. It's the one who just sees what needs to be done and fits in, you know, um, and that's way we can um, be effective. So I would actually, um, in a sense, when we're looking at careers, often people come, I've studied all my life to be this, and then on, they come out and they go, oh, there's no job for me. And they get very frustrated, you know. Uh, well, we are, you know, gee, I've studied my life and no one wants me, you know. I, I can understand the frustration. Whether um, wh- what I've done in, in my career is my research. It's okay. Wildlife. Sorry, my, my dogs are protecting <laughs> the, the, the habitat here. <laughs> it's I might so dog, I yeah, it's okay. No worries. And so I, I, I did my um, honours and, and masters, to, not to because I wanted to do my honours and masters, you know, not to solve some academic question, but solve a real question. You know, I needed to know what this, how to do this, and how to solve the problem. Mm-hmm. You know, and and therefore, and then you move your knowledge and research because you're discovering what is the issue. Mm-hmm. You know, what is the problem that we need to solve? And you, you move in your expertise in that direction. So you become extremely useful. Mm-hmm. Yeah? So the motivation of, let's say, being academic and studying 
shouldn't be that I want to become a snake study or I want to just learn about, I don't know, the shedding of snake skin because that just seems kind of interesting, is, well, what is that real-world problem that you're trying to solve? And that takes you on that journey of, of in, into the area. And then you become totally useful mm-hmm. because you've identified already that that is needed, you know, and then in, and your skills are already moving into that direction. Interesting, yeah. Do you believe that um, universities are skilling up conservationists of the future in the right, using the right kind of skill sets? Or do you think they're feeding people out into the conservation industry, um, into jobs that don't exist? I don't want to lead you in one direction or another, but how yeah, do you yeah. view the kind of training I mean, that's offered? I mean, I, I, I mean, I, the real answer is I don't know. Mm-hmm. But it, but the the secondary answer is that it does seem that way. It does seem, um, you know, when I I was you know of the privileged generation where we had free university education here, mm-hmm. you know, and you know, and it wasn't about a business. It wasn't you know it was right. about trying, you know educating um, you know people and you know. And now it seems there's two things: is we want to educate people to become good workers, yeah, um, or we're educating them because we, well, it's, it's making money. It's, yeah. really, it's, it's coming through the thing. Um, I guess maybe one of the things that might be useful, um, interesting, I, I got my um, undergraduate degree um, before I started work, or I've been working since I was 15, but, you know, at the kitchen hand. Um, but, you know, um, but my real uh, first real job, I would say, you know, rather than just, you know, working, you know, um in the kitchen yeah. um was after so i got that then i started working with animals and then my master honors and masters and that sort of stuff came after that because mm-hmm. i was already formulating the questions mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know and formulating the answers mm-hmm. uh, in the in the real world yeah. and I, I, i'm my guess and i'm just guessing that if i just stayed at university within that system i might have got led in directions that may not been useful. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. One thing we hear a lot from other, other people and from people seeking to kind of start their career journey is the, the value of experience of actually getting hands-on experience in terms of kind of formulating which path you want to follow, even sort of mm-hmm. test driving different roles, filtering things in and out, you know, just getting hands-on and helping to kind of build your resume as well and build your kind of employability. Um, what advice would you give someone who's looking to just get experience of doing this sort of stuff? Yeah, I, I would. I mean, often when students come to me, I say, look, hey, come on Echo Tour with me, visit mm-hmm. the rainforest. Um, you know, and next door, if you then want to go to research, oh, I've, I've got some, you know, great partners who are very academic, you know, do, doing research and introduce you to them. And maybe you can, you know, do your master's or PhD in the jungle and go from there. Yep. But also look at the whole picture um in a sense is let's say um i i i've in my position um covid permitting i would i would and i live in perth which is like a three-hour plane ride you know go up with all the drunken yobos you know every there's five flights a day up to bali and i can go up there and easily do my (laughs) conservation um so it's very convenient for me to to live here in perth and still be connected to the conservation work we do in Indonesia. Yeah. Um, but for my friends who live in Indonesia, um, one is you've got to be learn to you want to be learning, you want to love and live in that culture. That's a big thing. Yeah. Uh, and secondly, the, all the ones that actually live in Indonesia have married in Indonesia. Right. Well, because you know, most, you know, because the environment is rather harsh and different often your Western partner would, don't want to live there, you know? And so what I'm trying to say is that these social cultural things which come into, I see so many people who you think, oh, yeah, look, I want to go work in the jungle, live with the orangutans, but they get to an age that, they, you know, they want a boyfriend, they want a girlfriend, if that makes sense. They want to get married and have kids, and, and you know, unless they fall in love. Happily, sometimes they fall in love with a local Indonesian guy, you know, <laughs> and that, oh, good, tick, <laughs> you're happy, you, you know what I mean? You've found your life and that sort of stuff. But if they if they marry and, you know, fall in love with a Westerner, then they, they're torn, you know what I mean? They're torn between love and family and that sort of stuff and their career. 
And so I'm just trying to highlight those things because it's far more complex. You're buying into a whole lifestyle, mm. you know. Um, it's not it's not something that, yeah, and you've got to take that into account, you know, that um, it, it's, it's not you, when you're committing to, you know, living in the same orangutans or living in the jungle of orangutans, at least go do an echo tour, spend some time research there so you, you know the whole package you're buying, okay. you know. Uh, otherwise, you, you often, yeah, you know, whole careers are wasted in a sense. They study, study and that sort of stuff. And then, yeah, they fall in love and marry, you know, a wonderful young guy in Cambridge or something. <laughs> and so they end up, you know, <laughs> have, you know, doing another job, you know, in, in the UK in a totally different environment because, you know, that's where love has led them to. Okay. Well, I guess I've really enjoyed this discussion. It's been really wide ranging and informative. And I guess as we sort of wrap things up, I want to sort of think about sort of broader questions to finish with. And one that stands out for me would be um, how optimistic are you for the future of, of your project, your work, but maybe more like sort of conservation um, mission as a whole? You know, you talked mm -hmm. about resilience, and about being punched in the face and jumping over hurdles and 10 years of urgency. Um, here you are kind of fighting it. Uh, uh, how, how optimistic are you for winning that fight? Mm. Uh, the honest answer is, look, I don't know what the future holds. Um, but I know we can do it. Mm -hmm. It's certainly possible, you know. And, um, yeah, so, yeah, and, you know, our job is to make it happen. You know, and um, one thing we, we, we know, um, a great example, the Soviet Union, no one predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union two days beforehand. So, you know, so some things change, you know, so and, and evolution is like that, you know, evolution is, not, mm -hmm. is a slow progress. Suddenly something changes and there's a massive change, right? And, I, you know, conservation and saving the planet and climate change may be more like that than we suspect, although we seem like we're plodding along. In the next decade, if we get our act together, there may be exponential changes, mm. you know, which sets not only saving our planet, but conserving beautiful species such as orangutans, um, you know, as we get to the end of the decade, far, far much more likely and far more optimistic than looking through the lens at this stage. I hope you're right. Um, Leif Cox, it's been really nice getting to know you a little bit and talking on the podcast. Thanks for sharing your time, expertise with us. If people want to find out a bit more about your work and the Orangutan Project, um, where should they go? Um, they should visit the orangutanproject.org mm -hmm. and see our project, and that links to other tiger nails and projects. Or just go leifcox, one word, .org, and that's just my um, small personal page, which again links to all the projects and and academic papers and books and those sorts of things if you have more of an interest in, in, in my career and philosophy. Great. Okay. We'll put those in the description too. Once again, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been really nice to get to know you. Leif Cox. Thanks, Dean. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, everyone. If you did, then please do hit the subscribe button to get notified of new episodes as they drop. Um, and also please give us a rating or a review because it really helps us to get in front of more people. Now, if you want our help to get clear and get started and get hired as a professional conservationist, I recommend you enroll in our free online training program, exploring how to get a conservation job. So if you're a student, a job seeker or a career switcher, you'll learn the golden rule about how to get started, the key mistakes to avoid, and also we'll answer your biggest questions. You can check that out at conservation hyphen careers.com forward slash free. See you soon.